Na Terry. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dennis Utieno Owor is my name. I am an advocate and a certified professional mediator. Right. Yes. Today we want to talk about the rights of persons that have been detained, held in custody or imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, Wakili, before we even delve into the jargon of it, mm -hmm. why do we have these three names? Detained, held in custody, imprisoned. I thought this is one thing. I, th I thought they mean one thing. Ah, uh, they far and loose mean the same thing but mm -hmm. because most of the time you'll find that a person who has been detained in prison or held in custody will be kept in more or less the same premises but generally you'll find that uh, somebody who has been imprisoned it means that a case has already been concluded against them and as such there's a sentence upon them, be it six months, be it one month, be it even one day sentence, they'll be imprisoned. Now they are to be behind bars for a particular period. A person who is being detained or held in custody, you'll find that uh, this uh, person who is held in custody has been recently arrested. So that now they are just awaiting their case to proceed in court. So they'll have gone through the process of the police station, they have been taken to court and they've been given time to be in remand if they have not been able to settle bail or bond. Then a person who has been detained, you'll find that uh, maybe this, this is still pending investigations. There has not been a formal charge that has been placed upon them. So they'll just be detained. So you're just detained mm -hmm. and you see detaining and being held in custody are always interswitched. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And now let's get into it whereby um, we have the constitution saying that persons who have been detained or held in custody or imprisoned, mm -hmm. they retain all the rights in the Bill of Rights. Yes. Please explain to us this principle. First and foremost, uh, the Bill of Rights, these are not rights that are usually given to you. They are usually rights that you acquire by the mere fact that you are a human being. Most of the time people think that uh, you wait for the law to give you rights, but just by the mere fact that you are a human being, you have human rights. So the Bill of Rights, Chapter 4, usually enshrines different variable rights, like the right to life, the right to dignity, the right to privacy, the freedom of speech, the freedom to be able to express and access or even profess a particular religion so all of these are usually stemmed from the mere fact that you're a human that's usually the basic principle as long as you're a human doesn't matter which gender you are doesn't matter which race as long as you're human then you're able to have these rights they're not given to you they are acquired by fact that you're a human so that is the basic principle that that uh, processes from the fact that I am a first human, then now I have human rights. And you see, because the constitution is usually what we refer to as uh, the crowned norm, that is the legal norm that is the mother of all laws within any particular country. And these particular rights are always enshrined in the constitution before they are expounded in various different laws within that particular country. Yes. Okay. And it goes ahead to say that this is in as far as except where a specific right is clearly incompatible with their detention mm -hmm. so where does that what does that mean or what are these instances where a specific right is incompatible with detention you will find that the whole essence of uh, being imprisoned is you are taken to prison as punishment most of the time people confuse it to be taken to prison to be punished but the whole essence is you're taken to prison as punishment. So you're being separated from the rest of society. So one of the rights that you will be able to forfeit at this point in time is the freedom of movement. You want to be able to exercise it absolutely. You may move within the prison spaces, but also you'll be moving in the designated spaces of that same prison space. But now you want to be able to access the outside world. So that is one right that you will find has been contrary or in contradiction with what has been given as freedom of movement then you will find there are various instances where you'll find uh, 
the right to life for instance uh, very few rare cases where you find the death sentence has been preferred upon a particular accused person and in this particular instance you will find that this death sentence will be contrary to the right to life as enshrined in the constitution i believe it's usually article 26 or 27 thereabout and you'll find that because of this contradictory approach there have been many petitions that have been placed forward to find that uh, the right the the death sentence is unconstitutional because the whole essence of the prison system is supposed to offer rehabilitation and corrective corrective uh, services however you'll find in the most i think it was just within this year uh, joy irungu mm -hmm. was sentenced to death yeah. which is a maximum sentence it's usually life or death sentence and he was still sentenced to death so you see with that kind it was contradictory to the right to life yeah. yes so there are those instances where you will find that uh, your freedom to be able to access various spaces like now when you are in prison you are under the care and custody of the prison system so your privacy is no longer a guarantee because now you won't be able to have this right that you would have had where if you are outside however there are these rights that will still be retained if you are there like for instance the right to dignity remember you do not become less human because you're imprisoned you just become unfortunate that you're in prison so your right to dignity still stands but these other rights are the ones that start becoming a bit limited because now these are rights that you if you are free if you are outside there if you are following the society's rules and laws as put by the legislators you wouldn't be in this space where some of them have to be limited yeah okay and um, let's move on to the constitution, our constitution. Mm -hmm. And how how does it balance the the need to public safety uh, and justice to the rights of detained persons? Okay, so it's usually a very delicate balance: public safety and uh, justice to detained persons. Because number one, we usually most of the time we look at justice from the eye and the lens of either the victim, the survivor, but or the complainant. Rarely do we look at it from the side of the accused person or the person who is imprisoned. And most of because we usually look at the wrong from one side. We say, I was the one who was wronged. But we forget to look at the deeper perspective of if the same circumstance could have been placed on you as well, chances are you would have ended up in the same kind of situation. So what justice means to each person is usually very relative as what justice means to the state. Justice means to the state to ensure that there is public safety, that there is no one person who has been left to continue with an unending wrong. If it is theft, they have not just been allowed to continue with an ending theft because they'll call us civil unrest if somebody is plotting perhaps to even do treason they want to uh, commit crimes against the country or crimes against the president you see this will cause a lot of civil unrest because now we are not sure if we will have our leader by tomorrow so this public safety becomes a balance against what is justice for this accused person because now justice for the accused person will look a bit different perhaps in different circumstances for them they would look at it from the perspective not of legal but social and psychological so it will be psychosocial what would be different if you would have had a different environment what would be different if perhaps you had a different upbringing or if perhaps you had different role models or mentors how would that look like for you i would give it a good example of the case of uh, dominic Gwen that has been in the icc for a while and you'll find that uh, dominic Gwen was taken into the lord resistant movement in uganda as a child from the age of nine onwards and he was trained to be a militia so the biggest question that icc was asking itself is how do we treat dominic Gwen? because had he not been taken into the Lord's resistant movement, he would not have been an armed militia who had caused 
crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity. It would have been different. However, there is a crime that has already been committed at this point. So how do we now ensure, again, public safety? Because now you see, mm -hmm. it's becoming a balance. So yeah. when you look at Dominic Congwen, you see this is a childhood that was snatched away from him. How will justice look like for him? Because it won't be what the law posits. It will be more of social, psychological. How will he be able to heal and reconcile with himself that his childhood was taken away in a very unfortunate instance and he was made to retain a life of a criminal opposite his nature. Maybe deep down inside, just maybe, it's unfortunate at this point that this, all these have happened and it's very unfair even to the rest of the society. But just maybe, if the rules were to be rewritten, he would have had something different, which now makes us have a different perspective of when we're talking about justice for the person imprisoned and public safety. We should not just look at it from the law has already put this in place, so punish, punish, punish. Mm. We should be looking at it from how are we able to prevent or break a circuit? How are we able to prevent or even break a cycle so that we avoid more imprisonments in the future? Yeah. Okay, we have had a chance to interact with a couple of people who have been in custody or who have been imprisoned and now are out. Mm -hmm. And the one thing they say is that they will never wish for their worst enemy <laughs> to be put behind bars simply because of the kind of life and the and the uh, and whatever they go through while in custody mm -hmm. so how then is this the case whereby people um we have laws that have outlined how people are supposed to be treated but again on the ground let us be honest with each other that more, more often than not this mm -hmm. is not this is not the case and people get out of prison and they will never wish to, to go back there. Or has it been designed that way so that it deters you from, you know, committing offences in, in field? Okay, so you wouldn't actually wish for a prison life on anyone, even your worst enemy. On the first count of freedom, there is privilege in freedom that people don't usually underestimate until it is gone. You usually say that uh, privilege is absent to those who have it, is invisible to those who have it. So most of the time you'll find that uh, your freedom to be able to move from one space to the other, you, you, you're even able to choose a supermarket, you're, you're even able to choose a meal of choice, what you wear, that particular freedom affects you psychologically. So the first instance of why these people who have been incarcerated and have been released will tell you, I don't wish this upon any person. Is because number one, this psychological pain of lacking the freedom. Remember you've been detained more so as an adult. You've had maybe, let's say if I'm detained at 20, I have had 19 years of freedom. So I know how it feels to be able to roam around, to be able to meet my friends, to be able to just choose, pick and choose some of the things I'm able to do. Then at this point in time, boom, I'm only in one space, confined with the same, same people. And um, more often than not, it would be like-minded people. And we've already been told by society that we are degenerates. So if we've been given this tag, this unfortunate tag on ourselves, then at this particular point, even hopelessness sets in. So it is not even just the freedom of movement, but even your, the freedom of your mind that starts inflicting torture upon you. That's why you wouldn't want to start telling other people you wouldn't wish this upon your worst enemy. It's not that, uh, it's not that we are saying that uh, the prison is the best place to be, that it has the best services, because remember, it's not even a, it's not a five-star hotel. It's not a hotel nonetheless. So with the, the kind of setting, with the kind of environment that you have, that in itself it gives you a lot of psychological torture. So it's the psychological torture that continues with the mind over and over and over. Not even the legal aspect of it that is finishing you, it's the psychological. So why, why these people would say that is more of the psychological aspect. I don't want this upon anyone because of what it made me feel 
continuously over the next period of life. You see the times that you'll have high and lows out here. Because you'll wake up in the morning, maybe by the second week, you're so broke, you don't know what to do. You're very frustrated. But somebody just tells you, it shall be well. And then we might find, you find hope here and there, and then you're able to proceed. But in prison, you are in prison. You've been set away from, uh, you'll be set away from freedom. You're not able to move and rejuvenate yourself as you would have. You see, if you're here and you're stuck, you'll be able to say, ah, let me just go to the rural areas. Here you don't, you're not moving. You're moving from one corner to the next of this maximum security or minimum security prison. So the conditions themselves are also something that we are aware of because of the kind of um, resource base that we have. We cannot pretend to be blind that we have the best prison facilities that our inmates are able to sleep on their own beds and what have you. We are actually alive to the fact that because of the resource constraint that we have, because remember, prison survives on taxpayers' money. It's not just government running, but prison is also a government system that survives on taxpayers' money. So if the same same amount, we are all crying that we are being stretched, it's being too thin, if these are the same resources that are also being used in the prison system, how do you think then this person who is in prison, once they leave that space, in a very cramped space, um, health-wise, some things would be a bit, uh, they'd be a bit questionable. Even just that room for you to be, remember I said that privacy is out of the way. And remember as a human being, you need privacy. So if in every constant moment, if in every waking moment, you do not have your own privacy where you can even have your own thoughts to be able to process them. That continuous torture will give you that pain that you'll say, let me not wish it upon my worst enemy. Because this in itself, just being in prison in itself, even without looking at the amenities, without looking at what happens in there, just being in prison in itself gives you too much psychological torture. In your opinion, Wakili, do you think then this environment is conducive for rehabilitation? Mm, I would say, in all honesty, it is not the best for rehabilitation. The entire prison system has uh, the ideal look at having a rehabilitative. Remember, you were sent into prison as punishment. So then, whilst you are there, some rehabilitative and correctional measures are usually instilled. And Sometimes you'll find that some will be psychosocial, maybe they'll be health-wise. They were saying that this person was a, a person of unsound mind and they have decided to put them in the wing at Madare, at the detention wing in Madare, so that they're able to just undergo treatment because perhaps this crime would not have been committed had they not been, had suffered insanity. But you'll find the best environment that allows you to be rehabilitated is one that allows you to have at least some bit of freedom of thought. So once your freedom has been detained, you'll find that there are people, because of that pain of being detained, the pain will have to convert into rehabilitation. Like, I have no choice but to change. Then, for some unfortunate instances, there are a few uh, number of instances where you'll find that these people will get into society and quickly back despite the number of trainings that they received. If they were serving maybe a 10-year sentence, some have even finished degrees while staying there, only for them to come out and go back in. And this comes to the secondary approach of what does rehabilitation mean? Because rehabilitation for you would mean that I give this person a course to do, maybe in carpentry, in woodwork. Then you forget that even you who has a degree out here, you're finding it a bit difficult to get work. So do you have an, an integration system whereby, despite this person having this kind of uh, a record on them, because remember we usually have that certificate of good conduct that we usually go for, and it has our records. So if this person has this record, and we are saying that we rehabilitated them enough, to consider them changed for us to be able to release them after they've served their sentence. Does this even sometimes, even those who are released earlier, are we now starting to say that 
our rehabilitation has been good enough for them to be incorporated into society and if we believe so do we have opportunities set for them you see that angle do mm -hmm. we have opportunities that are clearly set for them yes. such that if we are reintegrating them it's not just a matter of saying that we give them vocational training we brought perhaps some religious training or even degrees some mm -hmm. people have been trained even in law theology mm -hmm. yeah. whilst in there once we've released these people in society, do we have maybe some places that they will go and proceed on internship without putting the stringent measures of, do you have, can you give us a certificate of good conduct? Yes. Because most of the time we usually say, all of us are criminals. It's only that we've not been caught. <laughs> so do we have these measures? Because rehabilitating them in prison is one thing yeah. there are people who will learn through their pain mm -hmm. there are those who will collapse in their pain mm -hmm. because remember human beings have different thresholds there are those who will just collapse in their pain there are those even who are innocent and are behind bars maybe perhaps they didn't have somebody to help them navigate their case and by the time they were saying guilty they are being informed that actually you had defenses that you would have worked with yeah. that would have ensured your freedom but now you are here we now need to rehabilitate you so you want to rehabilitate an innocent person what do you think is going through their mind at this point? They are already wrestling with a lot of denial. Because at first I was not, I am not this particular criminal that you've pointed me to be. But now you want to rehabilitate me with this that you're calling an opportunity according to you. So the question there would be, what would be an ideal rehabilitation mechanism? Aside from vocational training, aside from, aside from uh, religious training or uh, maybe handing over degrees and what have you, what would be this ideal training that would ensure that there is transformative rehabilitation? Not just, they're not just a training or educative rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah. Something for the record. That, mm -hmm. Yeah.